All right, welcome everybody. Um, we are doing a webinar today with the Minnesota Council of Teachers of Mathematics. We really want to send a sh uh, special shout out uh, to MNSTA and MCTM. Those are the councils of teachers of science and mathematics in our state. They uh, are help sponsoring this. And so if you're here because of one of those organizations, awesome. If you're here for another reason, awesome. We're excited to have you in this space. Uh, Angie and I um, have done this session together before in April at the MCTM conference. This time we asked our colleague, Sarah, to join us. We'll officially introduce ourselves in a moment. Um, and we'll be doing this again in live in person, but we wanted to do a webinar because we know not everybody can come to state conferences. And it's also something you can share with a variety of people or go back and watch again. So we're uh, super helpful that you, uh, excited that you're here today. Uh, everything that we're sharing today can be found at the link that I put in the chat. If you're watching this virtually, you can uh, grab the bit.ly or scan the code and go and find that. Um, on that document are a ton of links. Um, specifically, if you look at the things that are highlighted, this is where there's a folder of resources, including the PowerPoint, also where the recording uh, will be for this session. So if you need resources, open up this document. Uh, things that we're talking about today will be located in there. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm the picture in the middle. I'm going to introduce myself, and then I'll have my colleagues introduce themselves. Uh, we're going to all three of us be leading parts of this webinar today. We're going to have time for questions for sure at the end. So if you have questions or comments, we love when people come off mute uh, and talk to us. We are monitoring the chat. And so if you are um, don't want to come off mute, put stuff in the chat. Um, we're going to have some places where we want everybody to participate. We're also going to be going into Desmos today. Um, and we'll give you the links for all those things as we're going along. Or you can go to the link of links and go look at it all now if you want. Um, so uh, we are sharing everything. So I'm Sarah Vanderwerf. I have been at the Minnesota Department of Ed for almost two years. It'll be two years in November. I am the state mathematics specialist. Andy. Hi, everyone. My name is Angie Kalinich in Ojibwe Moangijik Mitigikwe Indigenakaz. I'm the science education specialist on our academic standards team here at MDE. Um, I started in February of 22, um, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Carter. Good morning, everybody. I'm Sarah Carter. I am the STEM and computer science integration specialist at MDE. I've been here almost four years um, and yeah, support thinking about STEM and computer science integration. And I think I've got the next slide. So we wanted to start by just kind of framing this about what is STEM. And I'm sure you have seen some of these before. And if you want to stick some others you've seen in the chat, we've got STEM, we've got STEAM, right? With the A for arts, we've got STEM MM, where the second M I saw recently was for medical, E-STEM, which is um, sometimes environment, stream, which I think is reading and art, which to me just sounds like school, all you're missing is history. But I know there's lots of different um, terminologies, STEM plus C, computer science. So sometimes we're talking about integrated STEM, where we're actually, I'll go back one more, <laughs> sorry, we're actually like teaching multiple things at the time. But sometimes we're talking about STEM with maybe commas in between. Like when we're talking about STEM careers, we're talking about scientists and mathematicians, not necessarily an integrated STEM career or STEM professionals. Um, so it's important that we get on the same page about what we mean when we say STEM. So go ahead to the next slide. So what we're going to be talking about today, um, and what I do in my role is mainly talk about integrated STEM. Um, and so this comes from uh, Roger Bybee's work on integrated STEM. And so we, when we're talking about integrated STEM, we're talking about intentionally designed and linked learning experiences. And that these experiences show standards-based best practices in each field, not in one or the other, but, you know, maybe, but in each field. And there's five models that he talks about. So when we coordinate, we're teaching in two, you know, two subjects separately, 
but we're actually coordinating when we're teaching things so that they're used in another subject. So maybe we're teaching an algebra concept so that it can be used in a physics class, right? Um, when we're complementing, we're saying that one subject is maybe complementing the primary subject. So we're maybe providing information so that there's this primary subject that needs the information. Um, correlating is teaching things in the different subjects so that students can start to understand similarities and differences. And that's where we are today. If you want to click once, Sarah, that one will be highlighted. That's where we're going to focus today is this correlation. So we're teaching um, processes or ideas in two separate content areas so that students can start looking at the similarities and differences. We can also, some of the other ones there, we can also do connections. So we're using one discipline to connect others. So maybe we have an engineering class and we're pulling in science and math and technology in that engineering class. Um, and then combining when we're using, the combining is more like this project-based, what you often think of when you're thinking of STEM. All of these are different ways of integrating STEM. Um, and as I said, today, we're going to focus on correlating. What we're correlating today is practices. So we know in the um, 2019 um, science standards, we have a set of practices that come from the framework. Um, in the 2022 math standards, proposed math standards, we have um, the uh, math practices, which come from the national work. We also have practices in computer science from the computer science uh, framework and in engineering through ITEEA. So thinking about correlating these different practices and looking for connections across them to help students understand similarities and differences between the fields. Um, and part of that is because sometimes we use the same word and it means different things in all of the areas. And so we don't want to confuse students, but we do want to help them understand the similarities and differences. Um, and so that's kind of just some framing for us to think about what we're going to do in this webinar today. And I'm handing it off to Sarah. Hey. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, she's Sarah with an H. I'm Sarah without an H, just so you don't get us confused. <laughs> no, we don't really care. Um, today, we're going to answer that great question. Um, is it possible for us all to do an experiment virtually? I don't know if it is, but we're going to try. And so we would love for you to participate just like if we were in person. Um, and so one of the things that you uh, can do if you want to get the most out of this webinar is we'd love for you to have some tape. So like you're not offending us if you right now an attempt for a second to go see if you can find tape in your junk drawer somewhere. Um, but it'd be great to have some scotch tape. Um, and it would also be great to have a writing utensil, something that can write on top of the tape. Um, you also need a surface of some kind, um, some kind of surface that you can put the tape on. So it can be a phone, it can be uh, a table, it can be um, anything um, that is a surface. So um, we would love for you to have those things. Um, as you're looking for them, um, I just want to talk to you about uh, MDE, the Minnesota Department of Ed, has a commitment for all K-12 students in Minnesota towards equity and supporting uh, families, students, uh, and educators around equity. And we have 10 points to that commitment, but we're really going to work on three of those today. We really want to focus in on monitoring the implementation of standards. As Sarah talked about, it starts with standards. Um, and we're thinking about what that looks like in our classroom. So everything we're talking about today comes from the math and science standards. Um, we want to improve the conditions for learning for all students. Um, our goal is to make them college and career and community ready. And so the things that we're gonna talk about today are building those things that they'll need as they leave K-12 education and give our students options. One of my favorite math researchers out there uh, has said about the topic we're going to talk about today is that mathematical modeling, um, and this could be true about science, scientific modeling and STEM modeling, has the potential to rehumanize mathematics by providing students opportunities to make mathematical connections. You can think about those as science connections, STEM connections, to themselves and the world around them. We're going to try and bring this quote alive. Um, throughout our session today um, so that you can make some sense out of what this means and communicate the, uh, that with the people in your sphere of influence. So because I'm a math person, I'm going to start with math. And every time I talk about math, uh, my colleague Angie will say to me, we do the same thing in science. 
Um, and so um, I always want to start anytime we're talking about math, but let's all agree that we have a common definition of math. Because a lot of times when I ask people what math is, they'll say it's adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, it's hard, it's fractions, it's geometry, it's algebra. Those are elements of math that's not math. Mathematics is a study of patterns and relationships. Math is a study of patterns and relationships. And so in our classrooms every day, in our K-12 math classrooms across Minnesota, we want all students to engage in noticing those patterns and relationships, not being told them that they engage as mathematicians and noticing, describing those things and generalizing them. Uh, what we're gonna be talking about today is a great way to think about that definition. So I'm always gonna start with the definition of math because a lot of times when I go into math classrooms, I don't see math. If it's a math classroom, then every day, students should be noticing something, describing something and generalizing something. By the way, this is a poster that a great math teacher in Minnesota, Greta Bergman, uh, made, she um, shared it with me. So I'm sharing it with you. Um, I started, if you were here early, I have this picture up. And I'm going to have us do a waterfall chat right now. So don't, I'm going to have everybody, literally everybody, put something in the chat, but don't hit enter yet. Know what's happening in this photo. If you've seen it before, make up something else. Um, I've used it one or two other times. Um, it's a photo that was in the news about three months ago. Um, what do you think is happening in this photo? Uh, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Um, if you happen to see a pink flamingo, you can talk about it. Don't think that there's a right answer. There's not a right answer to this. You can talk about anything. Um, if you notice five things, type them into the chat right now. Don't hit enter yet. I'll let you know when everybody can hit enter. What do you notice? We're going to start with this picture and we'll end with this picture at the end of our session. We'll come back to it to tie up all the things we've learned about modeling in this session. So you can hit enter anytime you want. Thank you. We already got something in there that there's two people discussing. There's something shiny. Someone's having a bad day at work. <laughs> um, there's two people talking. Uh, it looks like the back of the trailer got kicked in. Um, there's a huge mess. I wonder what got spilled. I wonder if the guy is in trouble. Uh, what's the white substance? Good, uh, good news. I'm going to tell you what that white substance is what this mess is, and then we're going to engage in some modeling uh, towards the end of the session. But just going to have to wait a little bit before we come back to it. So hopefully you're going to uh, stay to the end of the session uh, so you can find out um, what was going on. <laughs> um, ooh, John Olson is talking about inertia. We got science people in the house. I have used this with math people. They have not said that. So we are lucky to have great science people here. I also love the new form of Zoom allows you to comment on what other people said and also put some uh, reactions to that. So feel free to interact with people in the chat. Ten, we're in, you know, in all in the same place. Um, Sarah talked about the fact that there are common practices across all um, parts of STEM. Today, we're going to focus mainly on the math and science practices uh, in the new standards that are the future standards for both science and math. There is something called dimensions that overlay our benchmarks. And for each of science and math, there's a set of eight practices that define what does it mean to create mathematicians and scientists uh, that can leave our K-12 experience? What are the behaviors and habits of minds of our students that we want to create in the classroom so they can function independent of us? In the science and math practices, we're really interested because we know, especially in K-5, it's hard to get everything in. So what if, what if we could simultaneously be teaching mathematics and science at the same time? Is there overlap? So we're really interested in these practices. We see a lot of overlap between these two uh, sets of practices. And today is part one. We're going to talk about one of those parts of overlap. If you guys find this useful, we'll come back and do some more. But when we started looking for relationships in the practices, we looked at each of the areas of STEM and we said, huh, these practices 
seem to have something in common. So I'm going to pause and let you just read these. If you can't read this here, I also put a copy of this in that link that I shared uh, in the chat. Maybe someone can share it again in the chat um, again. Um, but I uh, put uh, this there. And I'm just going to pause and let you read these. If you notice anything, you can put it in the chat. Or like I said earlier, we're super cool if anybody comes off mute. But what do you notice about this subset of practices? If you noticed anything, you can put it in the chat. You don't have to. I'm not asking everybody. Or somebody can come off mute. Is there a relationship between these? The goal of this session is to help us think about what is the relationship between these? And then what does this look like in the classroom? Ooh, Dan, say more about what you put in the chat. Trying to move from what we see and what we don't. Do you mind coming off mute and saying more about that? Yeah, so um, all of these, you're starting with something that's more visible in some ways, and you're kind of taking it into like a more general form, which usually is represented some other way, like a graph or... Um, you're drawing it out or something like that and showing parts, but like not actually showing things literally, like showing how they're connected mathematically or scientifically. Dan, thank you. So we are, as I said, going to mainly uh, concentrate on science and math and what it looks like in these two areas. And because that's part of our standards in these two areas. And we're going to start with another definition. I have defined math. But we're going to start by having you define something. And so I just want to talk about definitions in general. If I was, we're not defining scale, but if I was to ask you to define scale, there's a ton of ways we could all define scale. Um, we could define scale as scales on a fish or something that you weigh something or scales in music. We also could define scale lots of different ways. Um, in mathematics, for example, we could scale a graph. We could think about a scale factor. Um, and there's lots of different ways scale is used in our general life, but also in our educational life. And the word model is similar to this. Um, and so we're gonna have you in just a moment define a word. Um, and we're gonna do that using uh, Desmos. And so I'm gonna put a link uh, for you in the chat. We're going to do quite a bit of work in Desmos. And right now, I just have one slide open to you, um, but we'll have uh, some slides related to our experiment and some other things that we'd love everyone to participate in. So if you've never used Desmos before, don't worry, it's super easy. All you got to do is click on the link. It's going to ask you uh, if you want to sign in. You don't have to sign in. You can just click below and say, continue without signing on. You're going to have to give yourself a name. You can give yourself a fake name if you want. You can give your real name. I have you on anonymous anyway, so I don't even know who's who. Um, thank you to everybody that's already in there. There's at least uh, 10 or 20 of you in there already. We would love, ooh, someone got Rochelle Gutierrez, who I quoted earlier as their fake name, their anonymous name. So uh, welcome, welcome, welcome uh, into Student Desmos. Uh, we'll keep uh, showing you that and giving you that link in a little bit. So I'm gonna turn it over to Angie to get us started with us having experience with defining modeling. Excellent, thank you, Sarah. Um, so Sarah talked about uh, a little bit about math. Um, I'm gonna share just a little bit about um, the vision and the the structure for our academic standards in science. Um, because as we talked about today, we're really trying to look for that space in between, the commonalities that we find um, between math and science. Um, and so we are shifting now to our 2019 academic standards in science. Full implementation of those standards will be the 24-25 school year. So we're still working on that transition. 
And one of the big changes um, in these standards is the shift to something we call three-dimensional learning. And if I was to summarize three-dimensional learning, we're really trying to move towards having students uh, figure out their own science, not just learn about science that other people figured out a long time ago by reading a textbook or something like that. So you'll see this focus on science and engineering practices that Sarah's talked about earlier, and we'll look at a few in just a moment. Um, and one other change in these standards is that learning is intended to progress in all three dimensions all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade. So students will be engaging in these practices, practice of modeling in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, all the way to 12th grade. And on the depth of their understanding of that practice and their sophistication and the use of it as they move through those grades. So if you can move to the next slide, Sarah. And uh, as we're looking at these practices, cross-cutting concepts, and disciplinary core ideas together in the next few slides, I want you to just pay attention to the language that you see here. Because some of this language, if you're a math person or even just from the slides earlier in our presentation, will look familiar to you. Um, and that's really what started these conversations between Sarah, Sarah, and myself about the space in between, thinking about um, how these different disciplines of math, science, computer science, engineering have these spaces where we do have commonality. So our eight science and engineering practices we just took a look at, um, our focus is going to be on developing and using models today. The second, or the second um, dimension in science are something called cross-cutting concepts. And these are kind of ideas that cut across the science disciplines. And we want teachers to kind of highlight for students when these things show up. So one example um, might be that we could look at cause and effect relationships in physics and chemistry and biology and earth science, or even something like patterns. Um, and so patterns uh, is an important cross-cutting concept in science. And, you know, from talking with Sarah, I learned it cuts not even across the science disciplines, but more broadly across even more disciplines um, in school. So we do focus on patterns in science as well. And then the big, uh, big science ideas. This is what most people used to think about as like the content of science. And one way that that's changed is that um, instead of like students learning sort of like um, concrete didactic facts, we've shifted to um, wanting students to have a deeper understanding of big science ideas, big ideas in science. Um, so you can see that we have like four in the physical sciences, life sciences, earth and space sciences, and there's some integration of engineering technology and applications of science into our science standards already as well. So um, as we discussed earlier, we are going to ask you to um, go into Desmos and um, we're just going to do a little bit of brainstorming here. And I really want you to know that um, as you're thinking about your initial or beginning definition of model, what is a model? And um, we'd like you to record some of your ideas in Desmos. We aren't looking for a right answer here. Sarah mentioned this before as well. We today are not working towards like one common definition of model. We're not doing that. We're really collecting our ideas about modeling. And some of you might have ideas that align more with modeling and math. And some of you might align more with modeling and science or engineering or computer science. But we're going to see if we can locate um, that space in between the commonalities. So if you have Desmos open, I believe on slide one, there is a space for you to just jot down some of your initial ideas. What is your initial definition of model? And this is really uh, for you. You will just kind of write those down, keep them in your mind. And then as we move through our investigation together, we're going to do and some other things, we'll see how that definition might have shifted or changed. So again, if you could go into Desmos now um, and just jot down a few ideas about your definition of model, I'll, I'll mute myself and give you a few seconds to think quietly and do that.
Sarah, here's just scrolling through some of the um the definitions that you all posted again anonymously, so you're not linked to um, your responses in any way. Uh, but looks like lots of people had like quick responses to that question. So thank you so much for taking just a little bit of time to think about and record some of your initial ideas about modeling. Um, and so we're going to engage in an investigation together and see if those ideas shift at all, um, or maybe they stay the same and that's that's great too. So um, this is the part where we get to do something fun. We're gonna try an investigation together uh, over a webinar. And for this short investigation, you really just need two, um, two items, a roll of scotch tape, if you have it, and then also a pen, um, hopefully a pen that could write onto the tape. Um, that would be most helpful. And so I have some slides that uh, have pictures of what it is we're going to do in steps, and then I'm also going to do them together with you. So this is a kind of a, a common activity that we do in science with students sometimes. Um, so some of you may have done this already before, but essentially we're going to start by taking our scotch tape and pulling off a piece that's like, like one and a half to two inches long. And you're going to fold over um, a very little, maybe quarter to half inch part of the tape at the top to make a little handle. Um, essentially, you're just making a part that's not sticky so that you can hold on to it. So you fold it over and stick it onto itself, and then you can kind of stick that down onto the table next to you. Or honestly, if you're on a laptop, I've even just stuck it to my computer next to like the, the thumb pad um, right on my laptop. And then as you can see in the picture there, on that little handle, we're just gonna write the letter B with our pen for bottom. So I'll give you a second to do that. So one and a half to two inch piece of tape. You're gonna fold it over one end to make a non-sticky handle and stick it to the table next to you. Um, you'll have this little flap handle sticking up and you're gonna take your pen and label on that handle B for bottom. All right, next step is we're gonna do the same thing again. We're gonna get another piece of tape about one and a half to two inches long. We're gonna fold over another little non-sticky handle, maybe a quarter inch. And this time we're gonna stick this piece of tape directly on top of the first one. So you can kind of see in the picture what it's gonna look like after you've done that. So it's gonna be stuck right on top of that first piece of tape. And you're gonna label that one T for top. So you have one tape labeled T on top and one tape labeled B for bottom. So hopefully you have both of those stuck together on your table or laptop. And then if you'll move to the next slide, we are going to pull both pieces of tape off together. So they're still stuck together, they're just no longer on your table. And the two little handles aren't sticking to each other because we made them non-sticky, which is great. And what I do is I usually just kind of run my fingers along them. It's a little bit sticky on the one side, that's okay. Um, and then the next steps, the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna grab onto each one of the handles and you're gonna pull those two pieces of tape apart. And then what you can do is bring them close together, but without having them touch each other. So bring them close together, but we're not going to have them touch each other. And just see what you observe. Does somebody want to unmute and tell me what it is they observe with their pieces of tape? When they bring them close together? Sarah's are working really well, I can see on her screen, Sarah Vanderwerf little staticky connection they're drawn to each other oh they're drawn to each other static that's a wonderful word anyone else notice anything different i was just gonna say they seem to want to go back together <laughs> yep they seem to want to go back together come back together we've we've split them apart and they want to come back together excellent now sometimes when we do this in class we actually have students do it in pairs 
And then they can test um, with one another. They can test their T to their partner's T, their B to their partner's T. We're actually going to do that on our own in just a minute. But I do have a short video clip for anyone that doesn't have any tape with them today. Or if you weren't able to get your tapes to work for some reason, we're going to watch just a short video clip here of what the results look you like. Probably okay, I'm going to separate them. Now, what do you see? Okay, T and B. Thank you, Sarah. So we saw the two pieces of tape, just like a couple of people mentioned, coming together. Um, and this uh, short video clip was actually produced by a teacher colleague and good friend of mine, Michael Lim. He teaches chemistry and does um, professional learning for physical science uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and he developed a lot of these videos for his students when they went online um, due to the pandemic. So he shared these, these videos with me. So because we don't necessarily have a partner next to us also making their own tape so that we can test what will happen maybe when we have the two T's together or the two B's together, we're gonna do that ourselves. So you're essentially gonna do the exact same thing again but I want you to make two sets of the tape. So we're gonna have a, you know, we'll make a B tape and a T tape on top of it. And then right next to it, we're gonna make the exact same thing. So we're gonna have two sets of the tape. And essentially what we're working toward is when you have the two sets of T and B tape next to each other on your table, you're just gonna pull the T's off the top and then you'll be able to test those T's together. And then if you wanted, you could also toss those away and pull up the Bs and then test the Bs together. So this is just a way for us to test, um, you know, we did the two different kinds of tape, the T and the B. Now we're gonna see what happens when we test two of the same kinds of tape, T and T or B and B. I'll give you just a minute to do that. Okay, so I have my two sets of tape. Again, I'm going to pull just the T's off. So I still only have two pieces, you know, one piece of tape in each hand. But then I'm going to see what happens when I try those two T's together. I'll bring them really close together without touching. And I'll give you an opportunity to try that as well. few people trying. Does anyone want to come off mute and tell me what they noticed this time? I see in the chat they repel each other. Anyone notice something different or want to add to that? that? You can come off mute and share if you'd like. All right, so I see they repel each other. I have one thumbs up next to that. So I'm guessing that is what people saw. And what do we mean by repel? Someone just described to me like visually, what did you see happening? They pushed away from each other. Thank you, Heather. All right. And so I have another video we could watch that would show that as well. Um, I had a 10 second clip, but if we watch the whole thing, I think. Okay, we're gonna try that one more time. It's stuck to my hand, but I, th I think I saw something very clear. And, I may and maybe you did too. So this can be done with one person. 
we did this together. You guys were watching and letting me a better example than the video in the warm up. Okay. P e mm. and T, right? I'm going to take it off slow. And let's see. Is it the same as T and B? Ah, I got my hand. I think that's going to change the charge. Okay. Oh, it's really sticking to my finger. Let's try again. Okay, it was it was really clear in the beginning before it stuck to my hand. But this is T and T. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And it looks like that exactly what um, Mike saw when he made the video is what some people saw here when you tried it at home. Uh, that the T's were actually attracted to your hands. They really wanted to stick to you, um, but they didn't seem to want to come towards one another. So they were pushing away from one another. Uh, Heather, I have a great question here in the chat. Is he doing it again because the result lessens if it touches your skin? Um, that's a really great question. Um, does anyone have an answer for that? I know we have some science people in the room. Does someone want to unmute and, and respond to Heather's question here? All right, I thought maybe I heard someone, um, but the answer is yes. So essentially, um, when the tapes touch one another or they touch your hand or they touch something else, they lose a little bit of that, um, that static that we're seeing. Um, and if I was in a classroom with students, we might explore that. So we might actually, I don't know, let's pull out some tape and we would check it together. Um, but just in the essence of time for today, uh, we won't take some extra time to do that. What I'd like you to do now that we've made some observations of these T and B tapes um, is to um, develop is to a de model based on your observations. Uh, so in Desmos, there's a slide that says develop a model to explain what you saw. And you could use drawing. So you could use a drawing tool. Um, you could use text, like you could just type. Um, or you could do a combination of both of those things. So again, if you open Desmos, we'll give you a little bit of time to try developing your own model. And again, you're going to develop a model to explain what it is you saw, what happened. So we'll give you a little bit of time to do that. And then we'll look at some uh, example models. I feel like I need Jeopardy music right now. I was just I was thinking that. Oh, such great things I'm seeing. Keep going. Already. People are quick modelers. People that can draw hands are very impressive to me. Absolutely. Can you share the Desmos? Um, with those 
responses because we can't see the pictures. It'd be cool to see. Yeah, I am. I'm putting some into Snapchat, so show them to you in just a second. Okay, thanks. All right, I'll be right with you in a second here. And having just a smidge of, there we go. I'll be right with you, Angie. I hadn't used Desmos before, um, before meeting and talking with Sarah, and I really like how it's an anonymous way for you to be able to share student work. There's some various platforms that do this, um, but this is kind of quick and easy, and I like that people don't have to really make an account. You can log in um, just using a name. So we're it's also, oh, it's also really... Yeah, really quick. It's also phenomenal if you're in person with your students because you can use your phone to take pictures of what students draw and automatically just upload it here and you can show pictures of student work. If you've never used that before, just Google how to use snapshots in Desmos um, with my phone and you can learn a lot about that. All right, Angie, sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. Thank you. So I see an initial model here. We have B's and T's and arrows kind of representing what it is that person observed. Oh, interesting. Can you go to the second one? I'll go again? back to the other one in a little bit. Okay. And then we see another one here. It looks like um, drawn out tapes. And I see some pluses and minuses. And yeah. And then the second one, I see arrows and it looks like two tapes coming together and I'm not sure kind of what I'm looking at at the bottom part there I think oh was, there's um, words pulling them together um, Got it. but I'll go back and just show um I'll scroll through so you can kind of see some of the things people were doing there was a lot of Pictures that had, well, I guess, let me ask this. What do you notice? Like, I know they're small, but do you notice anything about things that are common in people's drawings of the model? I'd love for two people to come off mute and say something that you're noticing in people's responses. I'll scroll a little bit, but two people come off mute. You can't get it wrong. What do you notice? I noticed that people seem to either draw like arrows and letters or else the tape, like the pictures of the tape. It was like kind of those two categories. Thank you, Heather. I'd love to hear from one more. Our patient. One more. Who's going to be bold and save the room? All right. I'll let Jeff look. We got to put it in the chat. So we're not all off the hook. What's something that you noticed about anything that people put in as models? Is there something the same? Is there something different? Can you repeat something Heather said or add on to it? I see a lot of people added um, positive and negative charges. Thank you, Heidi. Angie. Yeah, thank you so much. I noticed that as well. Um, and the positive and negative charges, that's something a little bit new. Um, so if you scroll one more slide, Sarah. So as Sarah mentioned, um, in Desmos, you're actually able to take pictures as people are doing things in person. 
and then you can upload them so that you can show them anonymously. So when we did this um, in person, when we were at the MCTM conference, that's what we did. We took some pictures of what people were drawing around the room and uploaded them to show. Um, and so these are a couple of the exact same models, um, but just during our in-person session. And again, we saw something similar here. Some people drew tapes, some people drew letters, um, but they were consistent in showing the arrows, either showing them moving apart or together. I don't think we saw charges though. Um, that's, I think, a new thing that we saw today, which is really interesting um, to kind of communicate that causal effect of what's happening. I wonder if that's because we have science people in the room with us. Maybe. Um, maybe us math people that know. I don't know. I'm wondering too. I'm thankful for, for those of you that uh, drew some charges there for us today. So um, so this activity might be something we would do with eighth grade students um, who are exploring this benchmark. This is like one possible activity that students could do to conduct an investigation and evaluate the experimental design to provide evidence that fields exist between objects, exerting forces on each other, even though the objects are not in contact with one another. So even though those objects are not touching. And this is an example of one of our three-dimensional science benchmarks that showcases the practice of um, conducting investigations, cross-cutting concept of exploring patterns, because we actually notice the pattern that um, opposite tapes, whether it was T and T or B and B moved apart and the same tapes moved together. Um, and then our uh, core idea, our big science idea um, of really thinking about uh, forces and interactions between objects. Um, and I did like, again, today that we saw some of those positives and negatives. People were really trying to um, show what was happening, like at the submicroscopic scale, that was causing what it is that we observed with our eyes. Um, so that is really wonderful to see in models. Next slide. Um, so I just want you to think back now, uh, and, and we won't write anything new down, but based on what you um, recorded as your initial definition of model, and based on the experience that you had, um, would you change your definition of model in any way? Would you add to it? Uh, would you alter something? Or maybe for some of you, it would stay exactly the same. Um, but I think like Sarah earlier, I'd love for one or two people to come off mute and just share your response. You could either say, my, my definition is exactly the same uh, as last time I could see aspects of what I described and what we were doing. Or maybe you will share, actually, I'm going to add to my definition of model now based on this experience. So I'd love two people to come off mute and share whether your definitions changed or stayed the same. See if we can get some new people. There's a couple of people also typing into Desmos. Feel free to go in there. Uh, one of the people in Desmos is saying, I, I would mostly keep the same definition, but I like John's idea about including inferences um, versus you know drawing observations. Uh, and they were talking about that. Thank you, Sarah. We have one more person that would like to share. Yeah, yeah, I'd share that I've been primarily working with K through six students the last year or two. And one of the things that I've been trying to manage is kind of the complexity of how we define models so that kindergarten students are creating models of a particular habitat. And thinking of some of the toys they have as models, but then that definition becoming more sophisticated as they move through the grade levels and the importance of So kids might not be familiar with charges in the fourth or fifth grade classroom yet, but maybe exactly. that concept that opposites attract and that's kind of the basis for my description of their thinking the tape is having opposite surfaces. And it could yeah. lead to other investigations of whether, whether that holds up. 
Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate you sharing that for another reason as well. I think that's a perfect um, way to illustrate the ways in which students' um, understanding becomes more sophisticated as they move through the grades. So I think you're exactly right. Like students at a lower level, they might think about, oh, these tapes are opposite. These tapes are the same. Opposites attract or something like that. And then maybe when they progress to, you know, eighth grade, they then have a deeper understanding of what's happening, like at the uh, sub microscopic level, right? That there's actually um, how the tapes are becoming charged. What is the charge? How are those charges interacting with them, each other? That kind of thing. So thank you for pointing that out. I could see how students could do the same investigation in elementary school and middle school and get something very different out of it um, based on their understanding. So Sarah, could you move to the next slide? Yeah, can um, I, there's this one response from Desmos that I'd love for you to talk about um, because it uses the word phenomena and that was a word that was new to me in mathematics. It's not one that I've generally used in K-12 math, but I started to adopt. Would you just talk about that word just a little bit since we have some other math people in this space? Sure, um, are you asking the person who wrote it? It can be you, or it can be anybody else. In fact, let's start, let's see if anybody else, it can be the person that wrote it or somebody else that's used the word phenomena before. Help us math people understand, what do you mean by phenomena? We have some science people here and I'd love to hear from you first. What do we mean by phenomena? Chat is okay. One of the reasons I ask what phenomena is, is if we're going to do STEM, then I think it's important for us to understand each other's lexicon and the way that we talk and write about things um, and the vocabulary that we use. And it's a word that I think math teachers could easily adopt into their classroom. But I think it's important for us to know how you use it in science so we can think about how to use it in math. So I'll have Angie define it, but I think there's somebody in this room who can help us even more. So I'd I love to hear so. a voice that's not Angie. And if you're yeah. a math person and think you know and want to take a stab at it, feel free to be a math person taking a stab at it as well. Yep, and thank you, Karen. That is pretty much exactly what I would say. Uh, phenomena are observable events that take place in our natural world. So it's something that you can observe happening. Um, and then our hope in science class is that those phenomena are things that we can then explore with our students to explain and figure out why those things are happening. So again, phenomena are observable events that happen in our natural world. And it's challenging to spell correctly. Yes, <laughs> and when do you use phenomena or phenomenon? That's something that I struggle with sometimes. And I will uh, talk about this one. Somebody wrote this in there. I'll talk about that in just a little bit using models of verb or now. So yep. Angie, I'll turn to the next slide. Excellent. Thank you. So just to kind of wrap up talking about scientific modeling. Um, so a definition I might use with my students um, would be scientific modeling is an important practice to support students in representing ideas and constructing explanations. Um, so what I love about modeling is it really gives students um, alternative ways to show us what they know. Um, it can be drawings, it can be text, it can be a combination of those things. Um, and so we're giving more students more opportunities to show us what they know. Um, scientific models uh, are representations that show how parts of a system are related to each other and explain why something happens uh, or explain how and why a phenomena is occurring. And in science, it's really important that we think about scientific models as representing a snapshot in time of understanding, kind of like Paul was talking about. Um, students are going to model what it is they know at this time and maybe as they learn more, um, then they are able to revise their models to include that new information. So maybe they could even take those, you know, observational tape drawings from elementary school. And when they get to eighth grade, then they might be able to add the charges to them. And it's not that one model is, is necessarily wrong. It's that when we know more, we can add more and make them um, just more accurate. 
Uh, and it's important to know scientific models can be drawing, simulations, equations. Uh, I think it was Dan earlier mentioned graphs, physical representation. So there's lots of ways to engage in the practice of modeling and lots of ways for students to show us what they know. And so finally, just an example of modeling even as like an equation. Um, so we talked a little bit about really models are representing the parts of a system and how those parts are related. And ultimately, we want it to describe, explain, or predict something that we see happening in the natural world. And so if we're looking at an equation, um, we have the components of the equation, force, mass, acceleration. We have the relationships, how those things are related to one another. And then ultimately, um, we want the interaction between those components and relationships to explain our observations. So when we think about the tape, um, the different tapes were components, um, the charges were components, those were all parts of what it was we were looking at. The arrows really represented the relationship that those parts had to one another um, or their location in the picture, like the fact that we had charges on the tape. Um, and all of that was used to explain what it was that we were seeing. So with that, I will turn it over to Sarah and we will talk more about these aspects of models um, and explore that a little deeper in math as well. So I wanna talk really briefly as we finish up today, what does modeling look like in math, but also like, how do you know if you're doing modeling? Um, and there's some nuanced differences between science and math, but there's a lot of relationship. And so one of the things Angie just got done saying is that there's some essential pieces of modeling, that there needs to be some things, some parts, some components. In math, we'll often use the word variables. Um, there's got to be a relationship that we're uh, investigating, that we're looking at, finding the connections between things. And then students need to be engaged in describing and then using that to predict and explain um, and doing those things. Uh, in math, sometimes we think about being a cycle, um, and I'm gonna kind of go through that because like I said, in the different areas of STEM, it's very much the same, but it, there's some differences that play out. So in math, we also have eight practices, uh, and these describe the behaviors and habits of mind that we're expecting to our students to exhibit if they're going to be mathematically proficient. And so when we think about modeling and math, I always go back to this cycle of mathematics. It plays out in mathematics that we're gonna notice something. We're gonna notice and look for phenomena, for things that are observable and changing um, in the world. And then we're going to want to do something with that. We're gonna wanna um, describe it and then generalize it. Um, in math, in our um, future standards, the 2022 standards that are in rulemaking right now, uh, modeling shows up in two of the dimensions. It shows up as one of the practices, but it also shows up as one of the contexts in which you can uh, engage in the benchmarks within our things. And somebody mentioned this in Desmos, um, but one of the confusions about modeling is it's used a lot of different ways. It's used both as a verb and as a noun in mathematics. This isn't, we're not even talking fashion models right here. These are ways that we use it in the classroom. And so when we talk about it in terms of the practices, one thing we're not talking about, modeling is not, I repeat, modeling is not demonstrating how to do something in math. That is not what we mean by modeling in this session. It is also not math manipulatives. A lot of times people will talk about using a manipulative or a way of showing the thinking to do that. Um, but what math is are the things that uh, Angie talked about. It could be a drawing, a graph, an equation. Um, it could be a way of representing your thinking. So if you're using some kind of um, tool to represent your thinking in math, you probably are modeling. Uh, in the math literature out there, it's been out there for well over 15 years, there's been a lot of talk also about a process of math. And so if you wanna know about mathematical modeling, it's super easy to Google because it was part of the Common Core Standards when it came out. And then tons of people created resources around this because Minnesota did not adopt Common Core math standards. It hasn't been as well known 
in the state of Minnesota. But I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of stuff out there. And when you look at the definition, there's words that pop up like real world. Guess what? Our current standards use the word phrase real world over 125 times our current standards. So, uh, and that'll be true about our future standards. Uh, it, but they also talk about modeling that it's messy and that it requires multiple math concepts and that you're translating between the real world and math and going back in direct, uh, both directions, making predictions. A lot of times think math, people think math only has the well, right answer. And that's actually not true in the real world. Most math is messy. When you are fitting um, curves or lines to plots, and then using them to make predictions, that curve is not going to for sure be the answer. It's just a curve that says, based on the observable data, this is what I predict might happen. And it gives us a range of values that might be better than other guesses that would be out there. Real world math is actually a lot messier than we think. So I want to give you some examples in math. So we're going to start way at kindergarten. And uh, when we think about what a phenomena is, it's an observable event. I want you to imagine a room full of kindergartners right now. And I'm going to show you a real example used in real kindergarten rooms um, out in the classroom. And so you want to start with something that's messy in a real world um, context. So imagine I walk into a classroom with a box of graham crackers. And so I walk into that classroom. Well, immediately, my guess is, Students are going to wonder, are we going to get to eat these graham crackers? And we have something we could start to observe. And one of the ways some mathematicians describe how this would play out in the classroom is you want to make sense out of the situation. You want to list the quantities. Uh-oh, there's that's one of the essential parts of modeling, according to science. There's got to be components and variables. List the quantities and make list the assumptions. And then you want to represent and explore that. Wow, we're making connections. We're uh, thinking about relationships. And then you want to interpret it and revise, and you keep going through this cycle. Now, is this the cycle of modeling? No, there's lots. And you don't want to get tied into one way of thinking about it. But in this classroom, the teacher, the kindergarten teacher, said, let's go through the cycle using graph crackers. So here's how it plays out, potentially in a math classroom and things. We start with one of the common routines of math. And we hold up this box of graham crackers for students and we ask our kindergarten students, hey students, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Um, everybody in the chat, I'd love for you to put something that you think a kindergartner would notice or wonder about. Not you, kindergartner, if they if I held up a box of graham crackers. So everybody you can hit enter anytime. What's something the kindergartners might notice or wonder about if I held up a box? Um, graham crackers. Ooh, I like s'mores. Can I have one? Yes. What else? Keep going. If you, it's blue. Thank you. Yeah, they tend to always talk about color. Are we going to make s'mores today? How many crackers are in there? There's a bee in the box. Yes. How many holes do they have? How many crackers do we get? It's a rectangle. It's breakable. All of those things are things students might notice. In fact, here's a chart from a kindergarten class of things that they noticed and things that they wondered. And then a follow-up question from the teacher was, what are some math questions we might ask about this box? How many are in the box? How long is it? How many are broken? Wow, you guys were guessing very similar things that uh, the kindergartners uh, noticed and wondered. And then, uh, and I just have a couple of the other examples of other kindergarten classrooms doing the same thing. So it's gonna be a little messy and different things. Yeah, and then they're going to tell stories about the one time they went camping. And then what the teacher is going to say, well, let's explore a common question together. You all want to eat some graham crackers. So how many boxes of graham crackers do we need for our class? So that's what was posed to this kindergarten classroom. Let's mess around and make some observations. And so the students had to record the elements of things that they needed to know in order to answer that question. They needed to know um, how many graham crackers were in the box. And so they were given uh, elements. They were asked and put into teams of students. And the students started making models and drawings of how they were thinking about what all the students would do. And they collected that group knowledge from the class and started to make some predictions about what they thought students were doing. They noticed, by the way, there's a ton of math in here. When I'm just looking at this, um, I don't know if they think everybody should get nine 
quarters of a graham cracker or nine graham crackers. That's a lot of graham crackers. But then the teacher consolidated the things that they were talking about um, with the groups and they made some predictions around um, what was going on. And then at the end, the kindergartners came in um, and ate some graham crackers. So if we think about that through the essential pieces of modeling, think about what were the components of what were the uh, parts, the uh, variables, the features of that graham cracker box that they had to consider. What were the relationships? A relationship would be how many graham crackers per person are we going to have to want to give out? And therefore, let's make a prediction of how many we would need for the whole class based on another component. The green component would be how many um, people were in the classroom, how many students were in the classroom that would be sharing those things. So when we think about what this looks like in a classroom, this this modeling cycle, this modeling process, this idea of doing modeling in math. So we want to start with something that might be a little bit messy in real world and have students explore that and come up with that. So I'll give you another example. Um, hey, Jeff, um, <laughs> as, uh, you, um, as we look at what's going on in this picture, I showed you this picture before and a lot of you said someone was in trouble, there's two guys, and that there's a big mess of white stuff and then inertia probably knocked down the bucket of things. Well, this happened to be in the news three months ago. And I'm like, wow, there is um, a phenomena here that we could use in math. In fact, it went through math Twitter um, and police uh, estimated that in this truck that was parked in a parking lot overnight, um, that 2 million dimes were stolen from this truck in Northeast Philadelphia, 2 million dimes. So what you saw is white stuff on the ground are actually a whole bunch of dimes. So you got that white stuff down though, those are the dimes that were left over. Uh, but they figured that like 2 million dimes were uh, taken. When math teachers saw this news story out of Philadelphia, they had so many questions, so many questions that you could investigate. And so when we start with, we start, is this something that we could do some modeling with? Does it have some variables and components that we could do something with? Somebody in the chat put down a variable, a component, a item, a thing that you think might be associated with the story. Anybody got something that you think might be something we could uh, pay attention to and think about? Ooh, thank you, Allie. How much money fits in one bin? Oh, mass, the weight of a dime, the mass of a dime. And so, yeah, I keep putting some things in the chat. As we think about this, this is what happened in math Twitter. How would you count that many dimes? I even had questions like, where would you take all these dimes if you actually stole them? Like, wouldn't people be suspicious if you show up at the coin drop and all you're putting in there are dimes? Um, and so when we think about this, it's got that first component. Um, and then is it possible to take those components and talk about the relationships and the connections and the describe, predict, and explain? So if you're wondering if students are doing modeling, I'm going to come back to that problem in a moment. I thought I would give you a slide to, with a bunch of questions that you can use in your school to say, am I doing modeling? Uh, in math, these are some of the questions that we ask to say, is this something we can be doing in classroom that is modeling? If you like these questions, I'm sh we shared all these slides with us. You can go and grab it. You can even call this your list of questions. If you're leading PD with other teachers, you can say, hey, let's start trying to do some modeling in our classroom. Did we start with a messy problem? Um, did my students ask questions and make assumptions and try and define the problem? Have my students tested their model and solution and revised it? Are they using mathematical tools to solve the problem? And you could put the word science in there. I said in math, there's kind of a defined process, but the problem with a divine, people get so tied into it, they don't, like they get stuck in the cycle. But even doing a part of it is engaging in modeling. So we often don't like to do that. Um, one place that I've gone away from is using the word problem and starting to use the word phenomena. But there's lots of other people who've made things up. They've even put um, for math, uh, sentence starters that students might use to engage in the modeling process and to think about questions that you would have. I love Dr. Jennifer Sue um, and doing things. And if you think students aren't doing this, I'm going to prove you wrong. This March, 
This is outside the windows of the MDE offices. This is what the weather looked like on March 15th. Do you know what else happened on March 15th of this year? A superintendent in Minnesota, in Rochester, Minnesota, tweeted something out that a student had done. This was the weather in Rochester, Minnesota. And remember that I started with this quote from Rochelle Gutierrez that map has the potential, uh, mathematical modeling has the potential to rehumanize mathematics and science and STEM when students have the opportunity to make connections with themselves and the world around them. So I'm gonna show you how that happened in Minnesota. Did you know in Minnesota, there's a student, Rochester Public Schools, who created a calculator. It's a website that predicts whether Rochester Public Schools is going to have a snow day or not. So if you go to that website, he created the code to do that. And if you're wondering how did he do it, well, he went to Superintendent Pacal and he said, hey, the student is Connor Moray. And the superintendent gave him access to all the data for the weather and snow days in Rochester. Um, and he used AI to create a school uh, snow day predictor. Um, and the particular day, March 15th, the prediction of the snow day were only 1.9%, not too great. And so what did that student do? He noticed a phenomena, looked at the components, got the stuff to go along with that, and then made some sense out of it. He was engaging in modeling and that's a practice that we know we want to build in all K-12 students um, in science and math and across the STEM um, things. So you all, if you want to engage with this, you can go and find all those STEM practices uh, for yourself. We sat down, Sarah and myself, also um, members of the math community, Angie, we sat down and tried to align these practices and we were going to give it to you in fact, if you dig into the folders we shared with you, you will find our alignment. But we actually think it would be good for you to try and find relationships with the teachers in your sphere of influences and do the heavy lifting. Because if you just take ours, you don't dive into the conversation of why are these related? What is a relationship? How might this look in our schools? Um, and we started to look for places that we could overlap. And we are starting Angie and I and Sarah to start to use common vocabulary to talk about our shared work and what we're doing. So remember these dimes? Remember this was a whole trailer full of dimes? Um, and I said, these are the important aspects and pieces of modeling. Well, the questions that you asked in the chat were the same things that we looked up. We started looking at how big a dime was because we were wondering what size of a vehicle you would need to take all these dimes away from. Like if you're stealing 2 million dimes, like what kind of vehicle do I need? And like, what's the weight uh, load that's in there? And we started looking at the measurements and the information about dimes. And then um, somebody talked about how much space a million dimes takes up and started talking about this. Um, and they were laughing about what it would take to do that. And then other people um, started predicting if I only had uh, 20,000 rolls, I'd stack and so on how they do it. Then people started talking about weight. They talked about quarters, by the way, and whether quarters would have been a better deal or not. Um, and they also talked about how awkward it would be to go to every coin star um, and try and deposit those things. There's tons of opportunities for us to explore a lot of things. And our goal in the math and science and STEM classrooms is to take these STEM practices and start to build these abilities in our students, not to tell them to do these things, but how do we create as educators the experiences so students can build these practices in themselves so that when they leave us after 12th grade, they have the skills to engage in the world around them. My watch knows all the facts I was ever taught through college and math. What I need to be engaged in this world is to be a mathematician, is to develop these practices so that I have hireable skills and that I can engage in describing the world around me. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah to kind of tie up any loose ends related to STEM. And Angie, if there's anything you want, and then we're going to open it up for questions for a couple minutes. And then I have a couple links that we'll share with you right at the end. So Sarah, any last comments you want to share? So Sarah, actually, Sarah just got uh, to me on the side and said she lost her internet. 
Oh. So unfortunately, she popped off for just now. So maybe we'll shift a question since we just have 10 minutes left. And if she can get back on, she can um, share some closing thoughts with us. So do you have thoughts or questions? Either put them in the chat or come off mute. We'd love to hear from a couple of people. What thoughts, questions? Ideas? What would you like to see Angie and I do in the future along with Sarah? I do have a question. Okay, I'm yeah. going to be teaching an um, intervention math lab, we're calling it, which kind of works out really well with this, with students who have, you know, historically not done well in math classes. And it's high school, 9 through 12. And I'm wondering if I should start to develop um, math modeling ideas by using more simple labs or models, you know, like you would do it with younger kids to kind of get them started on this rather than what they would be doing grade level? Uh, great questions. I'll give my answer and then Angie, if you have an answer, uh, you can do that. Uh, number one, Heather, I love what you're talking about because often with students who are in intervention classes, we tend to do low level skill work and we don't build in depth and complexity and modeling has potential for depth and complexity. They don't need more of skill work because um, if you look at our benchmark achievement level descriptors that exist in math, you will see that that keeps them in the does not meet standards category because that's where the skill work is. But if you want them to be proficient or exceed, it's students who have these practices built into them are the students that are able to do those higher level questions. We have adaptable testing. So what I would say is, yes, start with things that are below grade level give them confidence around things. But two, if you are going to start with grade level, the reason I always start with notice and wonder as a routine and a lot of math teachers do is because it's safe, you can't get it wrong. And so even grade level stuff, uh, material, all students, regardless of their background, can engage in. And so think about what are the routines that allow students to engage in grade level material. So you don't want to stick with below grade level things forever, but having up experience before you jump into other things often will boost uh, their confidence. And then if you do use grade level stuff, be okay with whatever models they're at now. That's your formative assessment. And then you use that to say, how do I now help them develop more sophisticated models? Because right now they might not be able to graph what you want them to do, but they might be able to write a sentence about what they noticed. And that's a generalization, that's a model. It's just not a graph yet. And so use it as formative assessment. Angie, would you add anything to what I yeah, said? Yeah, I was just going to say, I love what you shared. All those same things. I think your students might be coming in already feeling not confident about math. And so, um, you know, exactly what Sarah said and uh, modeling early and often. I think one of the benefits of modeling is that um, it's an entry point and whatever their models look like first then you always kind of know where they're at and how to push them forward. So for example, if they like only drew pieces of tape and arrows, but you were really hoping they would get at that underlying causal mechanism, right? The, the charges, then you could start asking them questions. Oh, I see that you were able to model that those tapes moved together and moved apart. What do you think causes that to happen? And it, it can generate these conversations that helps to push their thinking further in a way that isn't, um, you know, uh, feeding into the, maybe that fear that they would have of being wrong, you know, because they're maybe not feeling super confident in math. So that would be the only other thing I would add. Uh, Allison asked about examples in algebra uh, things. And one thing you can do, because there's tons of examples out there in the web, is simply Google it. And there's some really great things out there. But the other thing I would encourage you is start exploring. Um, if you don't know what open resource curriculum is, um, there's a lot of brand new curriculums that they give away completely for free. So an example of one in mathematics is uh, illustrative mathematics is an open resource curriculum that anybody um, can access for free. And so that one happens to be at, um, I have it built in. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Kendall Hunt, Illustrative Math. 
So this, you can go and buy this curriculum, but it's also given away for free. And if you launch that free curriculum as a teacher, so I'm going into Algebra 1. Do you see right here for the Algebra 1 curriculum that they gave out? Do you see how it says modeling prompts right there? For every single unit in Algebra 1, this particular open resource material has given away modeling prompts and actually different versions of them that you could go and use in your classroom. But there's also websites that if you Google scientific phenomena, you will find examples of phenomena that you can go and explore. My favorite examples, though, are things that I just steal off of TikTok. I have a folder in my TikTok folder that's called Phenomena because things that are current and happening and news stories like dimes are really resonate with people. And I think, how could I build this into a grade level standard as we're going? Um, that was a math question, so I'm going to leave it at that. But Angie, would you answer uh, the question we got from Robert Peters? What are the most common barriers um, that you're going to come up against when you try and implement these standards with fidelity? Yeah, I think um, one of the one of the big barriers, I mean, that I see in science is just that um, for some teachers, this represents like a pretty dramatic shift in, in what science classrooms look like. Um, so when I went to school, like I learned science by listening to a lecture and reading in a textbook and answering some questions in a worksheet. And then I would take a test and the test would be like multiple choice or fill in the blank. And um, this vision for science education represents a shift in kind of what students are doing in classrooms. They're the ones making observations, noticing, wondering, posing questions, um, conducting their own investigations, modeling, analyzing their own data. Etc. So they're engaging in these practices every single day. Um, and, and similarly, there was another comment about assessment, how they're going to represent their, their knowledge to us will also look different. It'll be in these artifacts of student learning, um, their models, um, you know, maybe their, their evidence-based explanations to one another, uh, their conversations and things like that. So I think just um, helping educators and, and also students recognize that this is a shift um, and see the benefits of that shift and work through it together. That I think um, is one kind of early, early potential barrier in implementation. I would, I would a hundred percent agree with you, Angie. I think the hardest barrier for math teachers is going to be the way most math teachers teach math is I'm going to show you how to do things. And so letting go of control of just showing them how to do things and believing that students have the skills within them to engage in this work. Because if we want them to do this independent of us, then we have to let them get messy with it in the classroom. It might not go well the first time. It might not go well the second time. But as you do it more, they will get better at that thing. So start to get past that. Start with something that you can handle. What's a common structure you can bring to these things or start with um, things that have been developed by other people. And then you can start to use things like the dimes problem and get more flexible with things that are outside of that. But letting go of control of telling them what to do. And my other thing I would say is you want to be OK with wherever students, when they show you what they can do, that's your formative assessment to help you make decisions about what's next. So don't don't get freaked out if they can't get as far as you thought. That's your evidence that they need to do this more. And so think about ways that you can do that. And so, uh, yeah, I would say that. There's other questions there, but we're also near the end of our time. And I'll stick around for a few minutes if anybody wants to talk about those questions. But I want to remind you, everything that we shared today, you can find um, in the folders um, that we shared with you. And so um, I'll put that link in there one more time. And so if you want to see our PowerPoint, if you want to see the videos that we shared today, if you want to see the Desmos and use it and do something with it, if you want to, like I even think in that intervention class, you could do the tape problem, do something from science in a math classroom. It doesn't have to be mathematics and say, when they draw pictures of tape, you get excited and say, wow, look at you, you're modeling. Because all of that is skills that are the same in math and science. And when students start to see those as connected, that's when we start to have a STEM school, not when they see those as separate uh, things. So uh, lots of things to consider. If you
we're here super early. Um, I shared a couple surveys um, with you. One is uh, the uh, Indigenous Ad for All EVA survey um, that is out there and live. If you're somebody who's been thinking about um, our state law related to including the past and cur um, current contributions of Minnesota tribal nations into your content areas, um, and you have thoughts about that, through September 22nd and share this link. We'd love to hear from you. Um, there are uh, groups of people now formed to start to build resources along with Minnesota's indigenous um, educational communities uh, to support Minnesota teachers across our state. So um, we'd love for you to engage with that. I'm also gonna put in, if you're a Minnesota person, the next MCA uh, is, or a MAP person, the next MCA is, a uh, MCA fours, they won't happen until 27, 28, but they're already being written. And the test specs for the MCA fours just came out. And so there's a survey open to give feedback on uh, these new tests. I know they're several years away, but this is when they're being written. So if you're worried about the next versions of tests, uh, go check out that survey as well. And then uh, I hang out with math leaders all the time. If you're somebody who's like, wow, I want more of this. I want to hear more of this. Um, and Angie also has a, a group that she meets with science people. Um, you can email, I work with our state organization, MCTM, email mctm at mctm.org and say, please add me to the Minnesota Math Leaders Group and you'll get emails about um, things that were, uh, you don't have to have a job that's called coach or curriculum director to join this group. If you're a teacher and you consider yourself a leader of any kind, you're a leader. Anybody that thinks they're a leader, you're a leader, just email. And all of that is on there. And I'll be out at MCTM. Angie, anything you want to announce before we're done for the day? No, nope, I think that's everything. Thank you, Sarah. Cool. I'll stick around if you have questions. But thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate you joining us and engaging in the conversation.